Hello everyone, today we are going to be mainly focusing on this woman, Mona El Tawi. According to Wikipedia, she is a freelance Egyptian-American journalist and social commentator based in New York City. She has written essays and op-eds for publications worldwide on Egypt and the Islamic world, including women's issues and Muslim political and social affairs. So from this summary of her, you could probably say that she generally seems like a sensible person, has criticisms of the Islamic world as we all do, and realises that women suffer under them. But she appeared as a guest on the Australian version of Question Time Q&A. And, well, I think we just have to go through it. This is her comments on what Obama said the other day about wokeness. I completely and utterly disagree with Barack Obama. <laughs> oh dear, let's see where she goes. Um, I go online exactly to tell people to fuck off when they attack me. <laughs> when they attack you or when they criticise you, Mona? No, honestly, it's, you know, this, this idea of respectability, this idea of civility, this idea of unity, all of these words, decorum, who invented those words? Those words were invented by white men for the benefit of other white men. Well, I don't know. Those words are derived from Latin words, and Latin people were generally Italian, so they weren't white at all. And I don't know about you, but growing up, it was my mother, a woman, who taught me that civility and unity were things we should strive for. So I think to say that these benefit white men and created by white men, that shows a deep lack of understanding of the history of language. And even ignoring me being pedantic on it, it's still a stupid thing to say. In systems and institutions that were always designed to be for white men, and they weren't designed for women like you and me and so many others, like you said, people of colour and gender diverse people. Well, that's gonna need a lot of citations. Uh, do you have any examples of that, Mona? They never imagined us in those spaces, and then we show up and we just ruin it for them. You ruin the idea of language, unity and civility, just by women showing up. Are you sure about that? Are you sure that's what happened? And so those who abide by the system, and Barack Obama was part of the system and remains part of the system. Oh, does that mean Barack Obama's white? I mean, the system's only there for white men, and as soon as it's not a white man in the system, oh, all falls apart. It's not what happened, is it? I also disagree with his wife when she says, when they go low, we go high. No, I fucking don't. If you go low, I'm gonna come for you. So no. I do not have the luxury or the privilege to sit there and be civil with people who do not acknowledge my full humanity. Who's refusing your full humanity? You're just making assertions here. I have no idea what you're talking about. You say you go online to tell people to fuck off when they quote unquote attack you. Like, what do you mean attack you? What does that mean? If they're actually insulting you, fine, insult them back, I don't care. But if it's just, let's say, civilised criticism, why are you doing this? That's stupid. But you seem to be justifying terrible behaviour because someone somewhere may have been terrible to you. Like, it doesn't work like that. I refuse, number one. Number two, there were so many voices who have found their platform on social media, finally, mm. after being the gatekeepers, refused to let us in for such a long time. But there are people who have never had any platform. I'm thinking of young black feminists in the United States. Cat Black, Francesca Ramsey, Renietta Lodge. You have loads of black young feminists. They're all over the place. One of those wrote a best-selling book and the other two, well, one hosts MTV and the other's a massive YouTuber. Of course they got platforms. Who's gatekeeping what as well? My channel can barely get monetized. Indigenous feminists in the United States and Canada, because I move back and forth between the US and Canada, there is one indigenous woman in Canada who every day tweets about missing and killed indigenous women in Canada. Well, she finally makes a good point there. It is true that indigenous people in Canada are getting just ignored, basically. Partly because they don't live in the greatest of towns with the greatest of uh, public services, such as the police. And it is mainly women who go missing in these areas. And it tends to be the men and other women, to be fair, but the men also call the police and say, hey, my wife, daughter, whatever's missing. Police don't really do much about it, unfortunately, and it needs to change. But of course, it's just the females getting ignored and not the indigenous males as well. Anyway, if you want to know more about that, just watch Simon Reeve in the Americas. It's a very good BBC documentary that's out now. Nobody has bothered to find out what happened to them. In the United States, really incredibly successful campaigns have happened online because we refuse to be civil to those who don't recognise our humanity. Citation needed. All you've got is me too, and that's falling apart as we speak. So for those who say, be civil, for those who say, be polite, I have an entire chapter on the political importance 
of profanity. Oh, she's got a new book coming out. She just wants to shill that. So that's just to let you know there. And I remind them of a Ugandan feminist called Dr. Stella Nyanzi, who is currently in prison in Uganda because she wrote a poem on Facebook wishing that the mother of the dictator of her country had poisoned him, that her birth canal had poisoned him during birth. Oh, Jesus Christ. I mean, she doesn't deserve to be in jail, but that is heavy stuff. Don't get me wrong, I don't think there's a single dictator in humanity that I liked, but, man, I wouldn't want them dying at birth. And when she was taken to court and during her sentencing, she was videotaped in because she's known for her profanity. She stood there in the video, she took off her top, she jiggled her breasts and she said, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> in court! Okay, she's a woman with a potty mouth who jiggles her tits around in court. Right, what's happened there? Oh, she's ended up in jail where she was going anyway. Okay, it's got attention to it. Anything changed because of it? The most memorable and taught about acts of civil disobedience were entirely peaceful and didn't contain much profanity. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Pretty much everything Mahatma Gandhi did. Look at the radical social change that they caused. And what's, what's your example? Oh, some woman jiggled her breasts in court and in jail. Well, I'm afraid we have to see the results of what comes from that. And if anything happens, well done, maybe you have a point. But they don't exactly stand up to my short-term scrutiny here. I disagree with Barack Obama. I agree with Stella Nianzi. Oh, well, lovely. Don't be civil to anyone because one woman in Uganda got her tits out and jiggled them about. I mean, don't get me wrong, I can appreciate an act of defiance and she should absolutely not be in jail. But I will take Martin Luther King over that any day of the week. Even though I understand he didn't really live his personal life to the best of standards, but hell, we're all human. Right, let's move on to the next thing. When trying to bring, out, bring about significant change, when is aggression and violence a better option than assertiveness, strong arguments, and modelling the behaviour you, you expect of others? Ashton? When none of that other stuff works. Yep, I'm totally with her on that. Basically, when you're at a point where aggression and violence is necessary to create the change you need, and obviously the violence is justified, yeah, I would say that that is absolutely a game. I don't think you bring down the Nazis with civility. I, I have a so great answer for this that a lot of people do not like. Well, colour me surprised. I want patriarchy to fear feminism. Oh, God. And... There is a chapter in my book on violence. There is a chapter on, on my book about white women who voted for Trump and white women who accept crumbs from patriarchy because they allow their whiteness to trump their gender. What the hell does that even mean? What do you mean that whiteness trumps their gender? Like, imagine blaming a whole section of women for their race because someone you don't like got into power. I mean, for God's sake, you've got criticisms of the Islamic world. Why the hell is Trump such a bad thing? Holy shit. I'm fully aware of this, but at the end of the day, even those white women have to recognise that nothing protects them from patriarchy. Maybe whatever the hell you think patriarchy is, maybe, just maybe, women like living in the Western world. For God's sake, we're some of the safest countries for women in the world. I mean, where the hell would you rather women live than in America, Europe, Australia, Canada? You know, where? Just tell me where! Nothing. For me, as a feminist, the most important thing is to destroy patriarchy. Yeah, that's all well and good. What are you going to replace it with? Oh, my own feminist version of civilization. Is that just a matriarchy? Is that all you mean? I don't know what you mean. What do you want? Tell me what you want. And all of this talk about how if you talk about violence, you're just becoming like the men. My question, so your question is a really important one, but I'm going to answer it with another question. How long must we wait for men and boys to stop murdering us? to stop beating us, and to stop raping us. Oh my god, what is that question? Let's try and steal man that, right? Okay, so, in her book, she says, if you are talking about violence and aggression, you are just becoming part of the patriarchal system. So what do you do instead? Well, just ask them. I, I assume this is civilly, <laughs> ironically. When are boys and men going to stop raping and beating and murdering women? And most men will reply to that, well, I'm not. So where the hell do we go from here? How many rapists must we kill? Not the state, because I disagree with the death penalty. I'm sorry, say that again? How many rapists must we kill? Not the state, because I disagree with the death penalty. You disagree with the death penalty, but your question is, how many rapists do we have to kill? 
I mean, my God, people's issues with Me Too was that it was going to be a witch hunt, but holy shit, you actually want it to end in lynchings. From the sounds of it, anyway, what type of person asks how many people do we have to kill? I don't care how bad they are, I have never had the question in my mind, how many bad people do we have to kill before the world becomes good? But I believe in rehabilitation for criminals, so there we are. And I want to get rid of incarceration, and I'm with you on the police. Oh my god, she's genuinely against any type of corrective procedure. And she seems to be against the state doing anything. She's literally an anarchist. So, I want women themselves. I want, as a woman, I'm asking, how many rapists must we kill until men stop raping us? See what I mean? I have never said, how many bad thing do we have to kill before good things start happen? Like, that's such an abstract question. Women in general aren't being raped. It's a horrifying thing to have happen, but fortunately, it is very rare. Unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of men think it's as terrible as you do. So Mona, them's fighting words. Spectator Australia is already saying Mona's um, promoting violence. Mm -hmm. Well, my steel man pays off then, doesn't it? She is actually promoting violence in an anarchistic state. That's what you're doing? Well, what I'm doing is I'm saying that violence has been owned by the state. That violence has been given by the state to its police. That violence has been allowed to continue unchecked mostly uh, by men, especially privileged men. So exactly how long do I have to wait to be safe? Well, that's a hell of a load of assertions. Don't get me wrong, I don't think the police are perfect in every capacity, but I do believe that the state has to have the monopoly on violence to make sure that the rest of us live in civility. They are there to protect your rights. Your alternative seems to be that we create witch hunts to try and kill all the rapists. It's amazing how close her thinking is to that of the early 20th century in the deep south of America. You know, when all the Emmett Tills and the lynchings happened. Okay. And when Let I say to Murray, be safe, Murray, there's a hierarchy you... of safety too. Hang Obviously on. people of colour, disabled people, etc. Murray... Everyone is safe, but some people are more safe than others. It's amazing how the left are all four hierarchies when it's there to beat the white man down. What do you think of that answer? How do you this, feel about this? I guess there's two things. One is um, there's a lot of um, smashing and destroying. Yes. But what's the alternative? So The alternative is a thing. world where I'm not raped and murdered. Right. Okay. I don't know how many times you've been raped and murdered. I'm going to take a while to stab in the dark and say that you've never been murdered. However, that's not his question. His question is, what system do you propose to replace, quote-unquote, patriarchy or the Western liberal civilised world? But you see, everyone has a different idea of utopia in their head. At least on the liberalism, they can strive towards it. Yeah. I would agree with that. That's... A good start. Look how awkward he looks answering that. I mean, what type of thing do you say to someone who has just said that? Like, oh yeah, the alternative is a place where I haven't been raped and murdered, when she clearly hasn't been murdered. And this is a guy who clearly knows that it's a rare thing to get raped or murdered in the Western world, in Australia. And he, I'm pretty sure he's just trying to hold in a laugh. Because I'd just be laughing at her at this point. Um, the other thing is, too, if you think about bullying, bullying begets bullies. So violence begets violence is what I'm seeing. So well, Yep, you have an action. There's probably going to be a reaction to it. But luckily we're about to get at least a semi-sensible answer here. L let me ask, let, let, let me bring, sorry, man, let me bring Jess in on that, about the, you know, violence begets violence. Well, you know, it's interesting. I think if anyone's shocked by what Mona's suggesting, you just have to look back to history and a certain faction of the suffragettes in the early 20th century, they used violence. They actually... They thought what they were fighting was a civil war between the sexes. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, they, they smashed windows. That one, one suffragette actually went up to a young Winston Churchill in 1909 and whipped him with a horsewhip um, at a railway station. I mean, like, there was... <laughs> someone likes that. Um, <laughs> Winston Churchill did a lot of shitty things. Well, you can contest that all you like, but one thing you can't deny is that Winston Churchill was actually on the side of universal suffrage. So why the suffragettes were after him, I don't know. But this is what I mean. They tend to choose rather poor targets. Um, so, you know, like, that was, for a faction, a violent movement. And the only thing that stopped their militancy was World War I. You know, if it hadn't been for World War I, there's no telling what might have happened because and they were fighting for their lives. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily because of a violent act of World War I, more than just 
something that they needed to defend themselves against as an entire country got in the way. Because generally we see these civil problems come out in times of peace. And World War I was Ashton, violence. Hang on, Mona, World War Ashton, I is violence by men against men. Mona, hang on one second. Oh my god, yeah, we know. That was her point. Her point was that to stop violence like that, you either need a bigger force of violence or an international crisis gets in the way, such as a world war. It's never the, the ideal. It's never the first thing to go to. Mm. But, you know, slave rebellions, I mean, there are many causes where people have resorted to violence as a way to finally break through and get hurt and achieve what we need. And if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. I, 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 yeah, I'd say I generally agree with that. If I can just jump in, Mona. Um, so I'm thinking, I just want to bring this conversation back to the land that we're on, um, Australia, whatever. Um, like, we live in a colonial state and... I think for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we are living in a constant state of duress. We experience violence from so many different types of systems. We experience it interpersonally. Um, yep, Australian Aboriginals don't have a good time with violence either. They suffer similar things to the Canadian Indigenous people. It, it's a massive shame, to be honest. When you say violence begets violence, there's something kind of... It's almost sounding like it's a pl like a level playing field, mm. which it's not. it's not. It's absolutely not. So no, um, when people say violence begets violence, what they mean is, if you have allowed violence to come in on the table as a legitimate way to do whatever you want, say, then you will have a violent reaction, whether it be more, less, or equal to the force of violence you used. So when you're saying, oh yeah, we want to bring about violence, well, what if the enemy's stronger than you? Uh, you sort of, you, uh, they probably are as well, especially since feminism is such a minority in the Western world. I wonder what our kind of tipping point in Australia is going to be when people are going to start burning stuff. Um, I look forward to it. OK, but if you start burning people's stuff or the state's stuff, then yeah, people may burn your stuff back and you may get what you wish for, unfortunately. Um... <laughs> Well, yeah. Harry's question was when, you know, is, when is it better off than assertiveness, and strong arguments and modelling the behaviour you expect of others? I what? think, oh, who's that bloody quote, like appealing to your oppressor? Oh, oh, you can oh, can I, uh, assault or is Assault you is cannot... core. Oh, oh, everyone listen to her, she knows something. She knows something. It's throughout history, no one has ever gotten their right or their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of their oppressor. I don't... OK, but slavery in Britain and throughout the British colonies was literally stopped because people appealed to Christian morality where no one should be a slave. They were literally using Christian verses to argue against slavery and say, we need to stop this immorality now and make it impossible. It is our Christian duty. And again, as I said before, what did Martin Luther King do and Gandhi do if not appeal to people's moral instincts. That's why they weren't violent, because ultimately people generally think violence is immoral, especially in a civilized world. If there was an uprising in North Korea, no one would blame them. It all depends on context, and in the context of the Western world, you are just not going to convince people, so you shouldn't even try. It's, it's, it's so fascinating this... for me that men constantly ask, oh, you don't want to become like us, you know, okay, so I... don't use violence. Move... Well, do you not think that's good advice? I don't think it's good advice to say, look, we've got a pretty good thing going here. Maybe violent revolution isn't the way. So I'm thinking about we live in a colony. Like, I cannot... We've tried for 230 plus years to appeal to the colonisers' morality, which just doesn't seem to exist. Yeah, I think violence is OK. Because if someone's trying to kill you, you know, there's no amount of, oh, but I'm really clever, you know? I'm, a, I'm, I'm really articulate. Um, no amount of that is going to save you. So I, yeah. I had to cut out a lot of her umming and ahhing there because I don't really think she fully understands what she's saying there. She's sort of trying to make a case for self-defence, which is fine. Violence and self-defence is totally justified, I think. But that's not really what's happened to the Aborigines in recent Australia. Because of the liberalism, they are able to do what they wish, generally. But they stay in their little enclaves and sort of have their own gated communities which is because of historical oppression don't get me wrong but that oppression has died way down and they're not forced to stay in there anymore there just doesn't seem to be the culture to try and integrate them with the rest of australian society they seem to want to keep to themselves and then i guess although they don't have the greatest education systems there 
maybe the state can help them with that. But from what I saw on Simon Reeve's documentary about Australia, the Aboriginals seem to just keep to themselves and not want to integrate with the rest of society. And that may be part of the reason that they are generally not doing so well. But because they're so far outside of Australian mainstream culture, they don't exactly get the attention that they maybe need for their areas. Again, they seem to stay in them quite a lot. There doesn't seem to be a lot of movement out of there, which maybe there has to be, just so the people who are successful can send money back. But in absolutely no way does their situation justify any type of violence. It's I a tricky think really good stuff. I think... mm, no, I don't think you can really justify that. But there you have it. Generally, feminists are still a bit mental. And to openly call for violence, arson, among other unjustifiable acts, all on national television, I'd say that's fairly bold. But well, I think that's enough crazies for one day. So, as usual, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, See you later.